Chapter 17, Manifest Destiny and Its Legacy, 1841 to 1848. Territorial expansion dominated American diplomacy and politics in the 1840s. Settlers swarming into the still-disputed Oregon country aggravated relations with Britain, which had staked its own claims in the Pacific Northwest. The clamor to annex Texas to the Union provoked bitter tension with Mexico, which continued to regard Texas as a Mexican province in revolt. And when Americans began casting covetous eyes on Mexico's northernmost province, the great prize of California, open warfare erupted between the United States and its southern neighbor. A victory over Mexico added vast new domains to the United States, but it also raised thorny questions about the status of slavery in the newly acquired territories, questions that would be answered in blood in the Civil War of the 1860s. A horde of hard ciderites descended upon Washington early in 1841, clamoring for the spoils of office. The newly elected President Harrison, bewildered by the uproar, was almost hounded to death by Whig spoilsmen. The real leaders of the Whig party regarded old Tippy Canoe as more than an impressive figurehead. Daniel Webster, as Secretary of State, and Henry Clay, the uncrowned King of the Whigs, and their ablest spokesman in the Senate, would grasp the helm. The aging general was finally forced to rebuke the overzealous Clay and pointedly remind him that he, William Henry Harrison, was President of the United States. Unluckily for Clay and Webster, their schemes soon hit a fatal snag. Before the new term had fairly started, Harrison contracted pneumonia. Wearied by official functions and plagued by office seekers, the enfeebled old warrior died after only four weeks in the White House, by far the shortest administration in American history, following by far the longest inaugural address. The Tyler II part of the Whig ticket, hitherto only a rhyme, now claimed the spotlight. What manner of man did the nation now find in the presidential chair? Six feet tall, slender, blue-eyed, and fair-haired, with classical features and a high forehead, John Tyler was a Virginian gentleman of the old school, gracious and kindly, yet stubbornly attached to principle. He had earlier resigned from the Senate, quite unnecessarily, rather than accept distasteful instructions from the Virginia legislature. Still a lone wolf, he had forsaken the Jacksonian Democratic fold for that of the Whigs, largely because he could not stomach the dictatorial tactics of Jackson. Tyler's enemies accused him of being a Democrat in Whig clothing, but this charge was only partially true. The Whig party, like the Democratic party, was something of a catch-all, and the accidental president belonged to the minority wing, which embraced a number of Jeffersonian states' writers. Tyler had, in fact, been put on the ticket partly to attract the vote of this fringe group, many of whom were influential Southern gentry. Yet Tyler, high-minded as he was, should never have consented to run on the ticket. Although the dominant Clay Webster group had published no platform, every alert politician knew what the unpublished platform contained. And on virtually every major issue, the obstinate Virginian was at odds with the majority of his adoptive Whig party, which was pro-bank, pro-protective tariff, and pro-internal improvements. Tyler, too, rhymed with Tippy Canoe, but there the harmony ended. As events turned out, President Harrison, the Whig, served for only four weeks, whereas Tyler, the ex-Democrat, who was still largely a Democrat at heart, served for 204 weeks. After their hard-won, hard-cider victory, the Whigs brought their not-so-secret platform out of Clay's waistcoat pocket, to the surprise of no one, it outlined a strongly nationalistic program. Financial reform came first. The Whig Congress hastened to pass a law ending the independent treasury system, and President Tyler, disarmingly agreeable, signed it. Clay next drove through Congress a bill for the Fiscal Bank, which would establish a new Bank of the United States. Tyler's hostility to a centralized bank was notorious, and Clay, the great compromiser, would have done well to conciliate him. But the Kentuckian, robbed repeatedly of the presidency by lesser men, 
was in an imperious mood and riding for a fall. When the bank bill reached the presidential desk, Tyler flatly vetoed it on both practical and constitutional grounds. A drunken mob gathered late at night near the White House and shouted insultingly, Huzzah for Clay! A bank! A bank! Down with the veto! The stunned Whig leaders tried once again. Striving to pacify Tyler's objections to a fiscal bank, they passed another bill providing for a fiscal corporation. But the president, still unbending, vetoed the offensive substitute. The Democrats were jubilant. They had been saved from another financial monster only by the pneumonia that had felled Harrison. Whig extremists, seething with indignation, condemned Tyler as his accidency and as an executive ass. Widely burned in effigy, he received numerous letters threatening him with death. A wave of influenza then sweeping the country was called the Tyler Grip. To the delight of Democrats, the stiff-necked Virginian was formally expelled from his party by a caucus of Whig congressmen, and a serious attempt to impeach him was broached in the House of Representatives. His entire cabinet resigned in a body, except Secretary of State Webster, who was then in the midst of a delicate negotiations with England. The proposed Whig tariff also felt the prick of the president's well-inked pen. Tyler appreciated the necessity of bringing additional revenue to the treasury. But old Democrat that he was, he looked with a frosty eye on the major tariff scheme of the Whigs because it provided, among other features, for a distribution among the states of revenue from the sale of public lands in the West. Tyler could see no point in squandering federal money when the federal treasury was not overflowing, and he again wielded an emphatic veto. Chastened Clayites redrafted their tariff bill. They chopped out the offensive dollar distribution scheme and pushed down the rates to about the moderately protective level of 1832, roughly 32% on dutiful goods. Tyler had no fondness for a protective tariff, but realizing the need for additional revenue, he reluctantly signed the Tariff of 1842. In subsequent months, the pressure for higher customs duties slackened as the country gradually edged its way out of the Depression. The Whig slogan, Harrison, $2 a day and roast beef, was reduced by unhappy Democrats to 10 cents a day and bean soup. Hatred of Britain during the 19th century came to a head periodically and had to be alanced by treaty settlement or by war. The poison had festered ominously by 1842. Anti-British passions were composed of many ingredients. At bottom lay the bitter red-coated memories of the two Anglo-American wars. In addition, the genteel pro-British Federalist had died out, eventually yielding to the boisterous Jacksonian Democrats. British travelers, sniffing with aristocratic noses at the crude scene, wrote acidly of American tobacco spitting, slave auctioneering, lynching, eye gouging, and other unsavory features of the rustic republic. Travel books penned by these critics, whose views were avidly read on both sides of the Atlantic, stirred up angry outbursts in America. But the literary fireworks did not end there. British magazines added fuel to the flames when, enlarging on the travel books, they launched sneering attacks on Yankee shortcomings. American journals struck back with your and other arguments, thus touching off the Third War with England. Fortunately, this British-American war was fought with paper broadsides, and only ink was spilled. British authors, including Charles Dickens, entered the fray with gall-dipped pens, for they were being denied rich royalties by the absence of an American copyright law. Sprawling America, with expensive canals to dig and railroads to build, was a borrowing nation in the 19th century. Imperial Britain, with its overflowing coffers, was a lending nation. The well-heeled creditor is never popular with the down-at-the-heels debtor, and the phrase bloated British bondholder rolled bitterly from many an American tongue. When the Panic of 1837 broke and several states defaulted on their bonds or repudiated them openly, honest Englishmen assailed Yankee trickery. One of them offered a new stanza for an old song. Yankee Doodle borrows cash. Yankee Doodle spends it. And then he snaps his fingers at the jolly flat simpleton who lends it. 
Troubles of a more dangerous sort came closer to home in 1837, when a short-lived insurrection erupted in Canada. It was supported by such a small minority of Canadians that it never had a real chance of success. Yet hundreds of hot-blooded Americans, hoping to strike a blow for freedom against a hereditary enemy, furnished military supplies or volunteered for armed service. The Washington regime tried arduously, though futilely, to uphold its weak neutrality regulations. But again, as in the case of Texas, it simply could not enforce unpopular laws in the face of popular opposition. A provocative incident on the Canadian frontier brought passions to a boil in 1837. An American steamer, the Caroline, was carrying supplies to the insurgents across the swift Niagara River. It was finally attacked on the New York shore by a determined British force, which set the vessel on fire. Lurid American illustrators showed the flaming ship, laden with shrieking souls, plummeting over Niagara Falls. The craft, in fact, sank short of the plunge, and only one American was killed. This unlawful invasion of of American soil, a counter-violation of neutrality, had alarming aftermaths. Washington officials lodged vigorous but ineffective protests. Three years later, in 1840, the incident was dramatically revived in the state of New York. A Canadian named McLeod, after allegedly boasting in a tavern of his part in the Caroline Raid, was arrested and indicted for murder. The London Foreign Office, which regarded the Caroline Raiders as members of a sanctioned armed force and not as criminals, made clear that his execution would mean war. Fortunately, McLeod was freed after establishing an alibi. It must have been airtight, for it was good enough to convince a New York jury. The tension forthwith eased, but it snapped taut again in 1841 when British officials in the Bahamas offered asylum to 130 Virginia slaves who had rebelled and captured the American ship Creole. Britain had abolished slavery within its empire in 1833, raising southern fears that its Caribbean possessions would become Canada-like havens for escaped slaves. An explosive controversy of the early 1840s involved the main boundary dispute. The St. Lawrence River is icebound several months of the year, as the British remembering the War of 1812 well knew. They were determined, as a defensive precaution against the Yankees, to build a road westward from the seaport of Halifax to Quebec. But the proposed route ran through disputed territory, claimed also by Maine under the misleading Peace Treaty of 1783. Tough-knuckled lumberjacks from both Maine and Canada entered the disputed no-man's land of the tall, timbered Aroostook River Valley, Ugly fights flared up, and both sides summoned the local militia. The small-scale lumberjack clash, which was dubbed the Aroostook War, threatened to widen into a full-dress shooting war. As the crisis deepened in 1842, the London Foreign Office took an unusual step. It sent to Washington a non-professional diplomat, the conciliatory financier Lord Ashburton, who had married a wealthy American woman he speedily established cordial relations with Secretary Webster, who had recently been lionized during a visit to Britain. The two statesmen, their nerves frayed by protracted negotiations in the heat of a Washington summer, finally agreed to compromise on the main boundary. On the basis of a rough split-the-difference arrangement, the Americans were to retain some 7,000 square miles of the 12,000 square miles of wilderness in dispute, The British got less land, but won the desired Halifax-Quebec route. During the negotiations, the Caroline Affair, malingering since 1837, was patched up by an exchange of diplomatic notes. An overlooked bonus sneaked by in the small print of the same treaty. The British, in adjusting the U.S.-Canadian boundary further west, surrendered 6,500 square miles. The area was later found to contain the priceless Masabi iron ore of Minnesota. During the uncertain eight years since 1836, Texas had led a precarious existence. Mexico, refusing to recognize Texas's independence, regarded the Lone Star Republic as a province in revolt, to be reconquered in the future. 
Mexican officials loudly threatened war if the American Eagle should ever gather the fledgling republic under its protective wings. The Texans were forced to maintain a costly military establishment. Vastly outnumbered by their Mexican foe, they could not tell when he would strike again. Mexico actually did make two half-hearted raids that, though ineffectual, foreshadowed more fearsome efforts. Confronted with such perils, Texas was driven to open negotiations with Britain and France in the hope of securing the defensive shield of a protectorate. In 1839 and 1840, the Texans concluded treaties with France, Holland, and Belgium. Britain was intensely interested in an independent Texas. Such a republic would check the southernward surge of the American Colossus, whose bulging biceps posed a constant threat to nearby British possessions in the New World. A puppet Texas, dancing to strings pulled by Britain, could be turned upon the Yankees. Subsequent clashes would create a smokescreen diversion, behind which foreign powers could move into the Americas and challenge the insolent Monroe Doctrine. French schemers were likewise attracted by the hoary game of divide and conquer. These actions would result, they hoped, in the fragmentation and militarization of America. Dangers threatened from other foreign quarters. British abolitionists were busily intriguing for a foothold in Texas. If successful in freeing the few blacks there, they presumably would inflame the nearby slaves of the South. In addition, British merchants regarded Texas as a potentially important free trade area, an offset to the tariff-walled United States. British manufacturers likewise perceived that those vast Texas plains constituted one of the great cotton-producing areas of the future. An independent Texas would relieve British looms of their chronic dependence on American fiber, a supply that might be cut off in time of crisis, by embargo, or war. Partly because of the fears aroused by British schemers, Texas became a leading issue in the presidential campaign of 1844. The foes of expansion assailed annexation, while southern hotheads cried, Texas or disunion. The pro-expansion Democrats under James K. Polk finally triumphed over the Whigs under Henry Clay, the hardy perennial candidate. Lame duck President Tyler thereupon interpreted the narrow Democratic victory with dubious accuracy as a mandate to acquire Texas. Eager to crown his troubled administration with this splendid prize, Tyler deserves much of the credit for shepherding Texas into the fold. Many anti-slavery Whigs feared that Texas and the Union would be red meat to nourish the lusty slave power. Aware of their opposition, Tyler despaired of securing the needed two-thirds vote for a treaty in the Senate. He therefore arranged for annexation by a joint resolution. This solution required only a simple majority in both houses of Congress. After a spirited debate, the resolution passed early in 1845, and Texas was formally invited to become the 28th star on the American flag. Mexico angrily charged that the Americans had despoiled it of Texas. There was truth to this claim, especially in 1836 when the Texans first seceded, but considerably less so in 1845 when the area was no longer Mexico's to be despoiled of. By then, the situation had become even more complex. More than a decade of widespread Comanche raids had further demonstrated the weakness of Mexican influence in the region. As the years stretched out, realistic observers could see that Mexico would not be able to reconquer its lost province. The most astute observers could further see that victory in war against Mexico would not resolve all tensions. A powerful and integrated network of Comanche tribes still had to be reckoned with. By 1845, the Lone Star Republic had become a danger spot, inviting foreign intrigue that menaced the American people. The continued existence of Texas as an independent nation threatened to involve the United States in a series of ruinous wars, both in America and in Europe. Americans were in a lick-all-creation mood when they sang Uncle Sam's song to Miss Texas. If Mexi backed by secret foes still talks of getting you gal, why we can lick em all, you know, 
and then annex them too, gal. What other power would have spurned the imperial domain of Texas? The bride was so near, so rich, so fair, so willing. Whatever the peculiar circumstances of the Texas Revolution, the United States can hardly be accused of unseemly haste in achieving annexation. Nine long years were surely a decent wait between the beginning of the courtship and the consummation of the marriage. The so-called Oregon country was an enormous wilderness. It sprawled magnificently west of the Rockies to the Pacific Ocean and north of California to the line of 5440, the present southern tip of the Alaska Panhandle. All or substantial parts of this immense area were claimed at one time or another by four nations, Spain, Russia, Britain, and the United States. Two claimants dropped out of the scramble. Spain, though the first to raise its banner in Oregon, bartered away its claims to the United States in the so-called Florida Treaty of 1819. Russia retreated to the line of 5440 by the treatises of 1824 and 1825 with America and Britain. These two remaining rivals now had the field to themselves. British claims to Oregon were strong, at least to that portion north of the Columbia River. They were based squarely on prior discovery and exploration, on treaty rights, and on actual occupation. The most important colonizing agency was the far-flung Hudson's Bay Company, which was trading profitably with the Indians of the Pacific Northwest for furs. Americans, for their part, could also point pridefully to exploration and occupation. Captain Robert Gray of 1792 had stumbled upon the majestic Columbia River, which he named after his ship, and the famed Lewis and Clark expedition of 1804 to 1806 had ranged overland through the Oregon country to the Pacific. This shaky American toehold was ultimately strengthened by the presence of missionaries and other settlers, a sprinkling of whom reached the grassy Willamette River Valley, south of the Columbia, in the 1830s. These men and women of God, in saving the soul of the Indian, were instrumental in saving the soil of Oregon for the United States. They stimulated interest in a faraway domain that countless Americans had earlier assumed would not be settled for centuries. Scattered American and British pioneers in Oregon continued to live peacefully side by side. At the time of negotiating the Anglo-American Convention of 1818, the United States had sought to divide the vast domain at the 49th parallel. But the British, who regarded the Columbia River as the St. Lawrence of the West, were unwilling to yield this vital artery. A scheme for peaceful joint occupation was thereupon adopted, pending future settlement. The handful of Americans in the Willamette Valley was suddenly multiplied in the early 1840s when Oregon fever seized hundreds of restless pioneers. In increasing numbers, their creaking covered wagons jolted over the 2,000-mile Oregon Trail as the human rivulet widened into a stream. By 1846, about 5,000 Americans had settled south of the Columbia River, some of them tough border ruffians, expert with bowie knife and revolving pistol. The British, in the face of this rising torrent of humanity, could muster only 700 or so subjects north of the Columbia. Losing out lopsidedly in the population race, they were beginning to see the wisdom of arriving at a peaceful settlement before being engulfed by their neighbors. A curious fact is that only a relatively small segment of the Oregon country was in actual controversy in 1845. The area in dispute consisted of the rough quadrangle between the Columbia River on the south and east, the 49th parallel on the north, and the Pacific Ocean on the west. Britain had repeatedly offered the line of the Columbia. America had repeatedly offered the 49th parallel. The whole fateful issue was now tossed into the presidential election of 1844, where it was largely overshadowed by the question of annexing Texas. The two major parties nominated their presidential standard bearers in May 1844. Ambitious but often frustrated Henry Clay, easily the most popular man in the country, was enthusiastically chosen by the Whigs of Baltimore. The Democrats, meeting there later, seemed hopelessly deadlocked. Van Buren's opposition to annexing Texas ensured his defeat. 
given domination of the party by Southern expansionists. Finally, party delegates trotted out and nominated James K. Polk of Tennessee, America's first dark horse or surprise presidential candidate. Polk may have been a dark horse, but he was hardly an unknown or decrepit nag. Speaker of the House of Representatives for four years and governor of Tennessee for two terms, he was a determined, industrious, ruthless, and intelligent public servant. Sponsored by Andrew Jackson, his friend and neighbor, he was rather implausibly touted by Democrats as yet another young hickory. Whigs attempted to jeer him into oblivion with the taunt, Who is James K. Polk? They soon found out. The campaign of 1844 was in part an expression of the mighty emotional upsurge known as Manifest Destiny. Countless citizens in the 1840s and 1850s, feeling a sense of mission, believed that Almighty God had manifestly destined the American people for a hemispheric career. They would irresistibly spread their uplifting and ennobling democratic institutions over at least the entire continent, and possibly over South America as well. Land, greed, and ideals, empire and liberty, were thus conveniently conjoined. Expansionist Democrats were strongly swayed by the intoxicating spell of manifest destiny. They came out flat-footedly in their platform for the re-annexation of Texas and the reoccupation of Oregon, all the way to 5440, out bellowing the Whig log cabinites in the game of slogans. They shouted, all of Oregon or none. The slogan 5440 or fight was not coined until two years later in 1846. They also condemned Clay as a corrupt bargainer, a dissolute character, and a slave owner. Their own candidate, Polk, also owned slaves, a classic case of the pot calling the kettle black. The Whigs, as noisemakers, took no back seat. They countered with such slogans as, Hooray for Clay, and Polk, Slavery, and Texas, or Clay, Union, and Liberty. They also spread the lie that a gang of Tennessee slaves had been seen on their way to a southern market branded with the initials J.K.P., James K. Polk. On the crucial issue of Texas, the acrobatic Clay tried to ride two horses at once. The great compromiser appears to have compromised away the presidency when he wrote a series of confusing letters. They seem to say that while he personally favored annexing slaveholding Texas, an appeal to the South, he also favored postponement, an appeal to the North. He might have lost more ground if he had not straddled, but he certainly alienated the more ardent anti-slaveryites. In the stretch drive, Dark Horse Polk nipped Henry Clay to the wire, 170 to 105 votes in the Electoral College, and... 1,338,464 to 1,300,097 in the popular column. Clay would have won if he had not lost New York State by a scant 5,000 votes. There, the tiny anti-slavery Liberty Party absorbed nearly 16,000 votes, many of which would otherwise have gone to the unlucky Kentuckian. Ironically, the anti-Texas Liberty Party by spoiling Clay's chances and helping to ensure the election of pro-Texas Polk, hastened the annexation of Texas. Land-hungry Democrats, flushed with victory, proclaimed that they had received a mandate from the voters to take Texas. But a presidential election is seldom, if ever, a clear-cut mandate on anything. The only way to secure a true reflection of the voters' will is to hold a special election on a given issue. The picture that emerged in 1844 was one not of mandate, but of muddle. What else could there have been when the results were so close? The personalities so colorful, and the issues so numerous, including Oregon, Texas, the tariff, slavery, the bank, and internal improvements. Yet this unclear mandate was interpreted by President Tyler as a crystal clear charge to annex Texas, and he signed the joint resolution three days before leaving the White House. Young Hickory Polk, unlike old Hickory Jackson, was not an impressive figure. Of medium height, 5 feet 8 inches, lean, white-haired, worn long, gray-eyed, and stern-faced, he took life seriously and drove himself mercilessly into a premature grave. 
His burdens were increased by an unwillingness to delegate authority. Methodical and hardworking, but not brilliant, he was shrewd, narrow-minded, conscientious, and persistent. What he went for, he fetched, wrote a contemporary. Purposeful in the highest degree, he developed a positive four-point program and with remarkable success achieved it completely in less than four years. One of Polk's goals was a lowered tariff. His Secretary of the Treasury, Wispy Robert J. Walker, devised a tariff for revenue bill that reduced the average rate of the tariff of 1842 from about 32% to 25%. With the strong support of low-tariff Southerners, the Walker Tariff Bill made its way through Congress, though not without loud complaints from the Clayites, especially in New England and the Middle States, who cried that American manufacturing would be ruined. But these prophets of doom missed the mark. The Walker Tariff of 1846 proved to be an excellent revenue producer, largely because it was followed by boom times and heavy imports. A second objective of Polk was the restoration of the independent treasury, unceremoniously dropped by the Whigs in 1841. Pro-bank Whigs in Congress raised a storm of opposition, but victory at last rewarded the president's efforts in 1846. The third and fourth points on Polk's must list were the acquisition of California and the settlement of the Oregon dispute. Reoccupation of the whole of Oregon had been promised by Northern Democrats in the campaign of 1844, but Southern Democrats, once they had annexed Texas, rapidly cooled off. Polk, himself a Southerner, had no intention of insisting on the 5440 pledge of his own platform, but feeling bound by the three offers of his predecessors to London, he again proposed the compromise line of 49. The British minister in Washington, on his own initiative, brusquely spurned this olive branch. The next move on the Oregon chessboard was up to Britain. Fortunately for peace, the ministry began to experience a change of heart. British anti-expansionists, Little Englanders, were now persuaded that the Columbia River was not, after all, the St. Lawrence of the West, and that the turbulent American hoarders might one day seize the Oregon country. Why fight a hazardous war over this wilderness on behalf of an unpopular monopoly, the Hudson Bay Company, which had already furred out much of the area anyhow? Early in 1846, the British, hat in hand, came around and themselves proposed the line of 49 degrees. President Polk, irked by the previous rebuff, threw the decision squarely into the lap of the Senate. The senator speedily accepted this offer and approved the subsequent treaty, despite a few diehard shouts of 5440 forever and every foot or not an inch. The fact that the United States was then a month deep in a war with Mexico doubtless influenced the Senate's final vote. Satisfaction with the Oregon settlement among Americans was not unanimous. The Northwestern states, hotbed of Manifest Destiny and 5440ism, joined the anti-slavery forces in condemning what they regarded as a base betrayal by the South. Why all of Texas, but not all of Oregon? Because, retorted the expansionist Senator Benton of Missouri, Great Britain is powerful and Mexico is weak. So Polk, despite all the campaign bluster, got neither 5440 nor a fight. But he did get something that in the long run was better, a reasonable compromise without a rifle being raised. Far away California was another worry of Polk's. He and other disciples of Manifest Destiny had long coveted its verdant valleys and especially the spacious Bay of San Francisco. This splendid harbor was widely regarded as America's future gateway to the Pacific Ocean. The population of California in 1845 was curiously mixed. It consisted of perhaps 13,000 sun-blessed Spanish Mexicans and as many as 75,000 dispirited Indians. There were fewer than a thousand foreigners, mostly Americans, some of whom had left their consciences behind them as they rounded Cape Horn. Given time, these transplanted Yankees might yet bring California into the Union by playing the Texas game. Polk was eager to buy California from Mexico, 
but relations with Mexico City were dangerously embittered. Among other friction points, the United States had claims against the Mexicans for some $3 million in damages to American citizens and their property. The revolution-riddled regime in Mexico had formally agreed to assume most of this debt, but had been forced to default on its payments. A more serious bone of contention was Texas. The Mexican government, after threatening war if the United States should acquire the Lone Star Republic, had recalled its minister from Washington following annexation. Diplomatic relations were completely severed. Deadlock with Mexico over Texas was further tightened by a question of boundaries. During the long era of Spanish-Mexican occupation, the southwestern boundary of Texas had been the Nueces River, but the expansive Texans on rather far-fetched grounds were claiming the more southerly Rio Grande instead. Polk, for his part, felt a strong moral obligation to defend Texas in its claim, once it was annexed. The Mexicans were far less concerned about this boundary quibble than was the United States. In their eyes, all of Texas was still theirs, although temporarily in revolt, and a dispute over the two rivers seemed pointless. Yet Polk was careful to keep American troops out of virtually all of the explosive no-man's land between the Nueces and the Rio Grande as long as there was any real prospect of peaceful adjustment. The Golden Prize of California continued to cause Polk much anxiety. Disquieting rumors, now known to have been ill-founded, were circulating that Britain was about to buy or seize California, a grab that Americans could not tolerate under the Monroe Doctrine. In a last desperate throw of the dice, Polk dispatched John Slidell to Mexico City as minister late in 1845. The new envoy, among other alternatives, was instructed to offer a maximum of $25 million for California and territory to the east. But the proud Mexican people would not even permit Slidell to present his insulting proposition. A frustrated Polk was now prepared to force a showdown. On January 13, 1846, he ordered 4,000 men under General Zachary Taylor to march from the Nueces River to the Rio Grande, provocatively near Mexican forces. Polk's presidential diary reveals that he expected at any moment to hear of a clash. When none occurred, after an anxious wait, he informed his cabinet on May 9, 1846, that he proposed to ask Congress to declare war on the basis of one, unpaid claims, and two, Slidell's rejection. These at best were rather flimsy pretexts, Two cabinet members spoke up and said that they would feel better satisfied if Mexican troops should fire first. That very evening, as fate would have it, news of bloodshed arrived. On April 25, 1846, Mexican troops had crossed the Rio Grande and attacked General Taylor's command, with a loss of 16 Americans killed or wounded. Polk, further aroused, sent a vigorous war message to Congress. He declared that despite all our efforts to avoid a clash, hostilities had been forced upon the country by the shedding of American blood upon the American soil. A patriotic Congress overwhelmingly voted for war, and enthusiastic volunteers cried, Ho for the halls of the Montezumas, and Mexico or death. Inflamed by the war fever, even anti-slavery Whig bastions melted and joined with the rest of the nation, though they later condemned Jimmy Polk's war. As James Russell Lowell of Massachusetts lamented, Massachusetts, God forgive her, she's a kneeling with the rest. In his message to Congress, Polk was making history, not writing it. Like many presidents with ambitious foreign policy goals, he felt justified in bending the truth, if that was what it took to bend a reluctant public toward war. If he had been a historian, Polk would have explained that American blood had been shed on soil that the Mexicans had good reason to regard as their own. A gangling, rough-featured Whig congressman from Illinois, one Abraham Lincoln, introduced certain resolutions that requested information as to the precise spot on American soil where American blood had been shed. He pushed his spot resolutions with such persistence that he came to be known as the Spotty Lincoln, 
who could die of spotted fever. The more extreme anti-slavery agitators of the North, many of them Whigs, branded the president a liar. Polk the mendacious. Did Polk provoke war? California was an imperative point to his program, and a Mexico... Did Polk provoke war? California was an imperative point in his program, and Mexico would not sell it at any price. The only way to get it was to use force or wait for an internal American revolt. Yet delay seemed dangerous, for the claws of the British lion might snatch the ripening California fruit from the talons of the American eagle. Grievances against Mexico were annoying yet tolerable. In later years, America endured even worse ones. But in 1846, patience had ceased to be a virtue, as far as Polk was concerned. Bent on grasping California by fair means or foul, he pushed the quarrel to a bloody showdown. Both sides, in fact, were spoiling for a fight. Feisty Americans, especially southwestern expansionists, were eager to teach the Mexicans a lesson. The Mexicans, in turn, were burning to humiliate the bullies of the north. Possessing a considerable standing army, heavily overstaffed with generals, they boasted of invading the United States freeing the black slaves, and lassoing whole regiments of Americans. They were hoping that the quarrel with Britain over Oregon would blossom into a full-dress war, as it came near doing, and further pin down the hated Yankees. A conquest of Mexico's vast and arid expanses seemed fantastic, especially in view of the bungling American invasion of Canada in 1812. Both sides were fired by moral indignation. The Mexican people could fight with the flaming sword of righteousness, for had not the insolent Yankee picked a fight by polluting their soil? Many earnest Americans, on the other hand, sincerely believed that Mexico was the aggressor. Polk wanted California, not war, but when war came, he hoped to fight it on a limited scale and then pull out when he had captured the prize. The dethroned Mexican dictator Santa Ana, then exiled with his teenage bride in Cuba, let it be known that if the American blockading squadron would permit him to slip into Mexico, he would sell out his country. Incredibly, Polk agreed to this discreditable intrigue. But the double-crossing Santa Ana, once he returned to Mexico, proceeded to rally his countrymen to a desperate defense of their soil. American operations in the Southwest and in California were completely successful. In 1846, General Stephen W. Kearney led a detachment of 1,700 troops over the famous Santa Fe Trail from Fort Leavenworth to Santa Fe. This sun-baked outpost, with its drowsy plazas, was easily captured. But before Kearney could reach California, the fertile province was won. When war broke out, Captain John C. Fremont, the dashing explorer, just happened to be there with several dozen well-armed men. In helping to overthrow Mexican rule in 1846, he collaborated with American naval officers and with the local Americans who had hoisted the banner of the short-lived California Bear Flag Republic. General Zachary Taylor, meanwhile, had been spearheading the main thrust, known as Old Rough and Ready, because of his iron constitution and incredibly unsoldierly appearance, he sometimes wore a Mexican straw hat. He fought his way across the Rio Grande into Mexico. After several gratifying victories, he reached Buena Vista. There, on February 22 and 23, 1847, his weakened force of 5,000 men was attacked by some 20,000 march-weary troops under Santa Ana. The Mexicans were finally repulsed with extreme difficulty, and overnight Zachary Taylor became the hero of Buena Vista. One Kentuckian was heard to say that Old Zach would be elected president in 1848 by spontaneous combustion. Sound American strategy now called for a crushing blow at the enemy's vitals, Mexico City. General Taylor thought a good leader of modest-sized forces could not win decisively in the semi-deserts of northern Mexico. The command of the main expedition, 
which pushed inland from the coast city of Veracruz early in 1847, was entrusted to General Winfield Scott. A handsome giant of a man, Scott had emerged as a hero from the War of 1812 and had later earned the nickname Old Fuss and Feathers because of his resplendent uniforms and strict discipline. He was severely handicapped in the Mexican campaign by inadequate numbers of troops, by expiring enlistments, by a more numerous enemy, by mountainous terrain, by disease, and by political backbiting at home. Yet he succeeded in battling his way up to Mexico City by September 1847, in one of the most brilliant campaigns in American military annals. He proved to be the most distinguished general produced by his country between the Revolution and the Civil War. Polk was anxious to end the shooting as soon as he could secure his territorial goals. Accordingly, he sent along with Scott's invading army the chief clerk of the State Department, Nicholas P. Trist, who among other weaknesses was afflicted with an overfluid pen. Trist and Scott arranged for an armistice with Santa Ana at a cost of $10,000. The wily dictator pocketed the bribe and then used the time to bolster his defenses. Negotiating a treaty with a sword in one hand and a pen in the other was ticklish business. Polk, disgusted with his blundering envoy, abruptly recalled Trist. The wordy diplomat then dashed off a 65-page letter explaining why he was not coming home. The president was furious. But Trist, grasping a fleeting opportunity to negotiate, signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on February 2, 1848, and forwarded it to Washington. The terms of the treaty were breathtaking. They confirmed the American title to Texas and yielded the enormous area stretching westward to Oregon and the ocean and embracing coveted California. This total expanse, including Texas, was about one half of Mexico. The United States agreed to pay $15 million for the land and to assume the claims of its citizens against Mexico in the amount of $3 million $250,000. Polk submitted the treaty to the Senate. Although Trist had proved highly annoying, he had generally followed his original instructions, and speed was imperative. The anti-slavery Whigs in Congress, dubbed Mexican Whigs or Conscience Whigs, were denouncing this damnable war with increasing heat. Having secured control of the House in 1847, they were even threatening to vote down supplies for the armies in the field. If they had done so, Scott probably would have been forced to retreat, and the fruits of victory might have been tossed away. Another peril impended. A swelling group of expansionists, intoxicated by manifest destiny, was clamoring for all of Mexico. If America had seized it, the nation would have been saddled with an expansive and vexatious policing problem. Far-seeing Southerners like Calhoun, alarmed by the mounting anger of anti-slavery agitators, realized that the South would do well not to be too greedy. The treaty was finally approved by the Senate 38-14. to 14. Oddly enough, it was condemned both by those opponents who wanted all of Mexico and by opponents who wanted none of it. Victors rarely pay an indemnity, especially after a costly conflict has been forced on them. Yet Polk, who had planned to offer $25 million before fighting the war, arranged to pay $18,250,000 after winning it. Cynics have charged that the Americans were pricked by guilty conscience. Apologists have pointed proudly to the Anglo-Saxon spirit of fair play. A decisive factor was the need for haste while there was still a responsible Mexican government to carry out the treaty, and before political foes in the United States, notably the anti-slavery zealots, sabotaged Polk's expansionist program. As wars go, the Mexican War was a small one. It cost some 13,000 American lives, most of them taken by disease. But the fruits of the fighting were enormous. America's total expanse, already vast, was increased by about one-third, counting Texas an addition even greater than that of the Louisiana Purchase. A sharp stimulus was given to the spirit of manifest destiny, for as the proverb has it, the appetite comes with eating. 
The Mexican War proved to be the blood-spattered schoolroom of the Civil War. The campaigns provided priceless field experience for most of the officers destined to become leading generals in the forthcoming conflict, including Captain Robert E. Lee and Lieutenant Ulysses S. Grant. The Military Academy at West Point, founded in 1802, fully justified its existence through the well-trained officers. Useful also was the Navy, which did valuable work in throwing a crippling blockade around Mexican ports. A new academy at Annapolis had just been established by Navy Secretary and historian George Bancroft in 1845. The Marine Corps, in existence since 1798, won new laurels and to this day sings in its stirring hymn about the halls of Montezuma. The Army waged war without defeat and without a major blunder, despite formidable obstacles and a half dozen or so achingly long marches. Chagrined British critics, as well as other foreign skeptics, reluctantly revised upward their estimate of Yankee military prowess. Opposing armies, moreover, emerged with increasing respect for each other. The Mexicans, though poorly led, fought heroically. At Chapultepec, near Mexico City, the teenage lads of the military academy there, Los Niños, perished to a boy. Long-memoried Mexicans have never forgotten that their northern enemy tore away about half of their country. The argument that they were lucky not to lose all of it, and that they had been paid something for their land, has scarcely lessened their bitterness. The war also marked an ugly turning point in relations between the United States and Latin America as a whole. Hitherto, Uncle Sam has been regarded with some complacency, even friendliness. Henceforth, he was increasingly feared as the Colossus of the North. Suspicious neighbors to the South condemned him as a greedy and untrustworthy bully who might next despoil them of their soil. Most ominous of all, the war re-aroused the snarling dog of the slavery issue, and the beast did not stop yelping until drowned in the blood of the Civil War. Abolitionists assailed the Mexican conflict as one provoked by the Southern slaveocracy for its own evil purposes. As James Russell Lowell had Hosea Bigelow draw in his Yankee dialect, they just want this California, so as to lug new slave states in, to abuse ye and to scorn ye, and to plunder ye like sin. In addition with Lowell's charge, the bulk of the American volunteers were admittedly from the South and Southwest. But, as in the case of the Texas Revolution, the basic explanation was proximity rather than conspiracy. Quarreling over slavery extension also erupted on the floors of Congress. In 1846, shortly after the shooting started, Polk had requested an appropriation of $2 million with which to buy a piece. Representative David Wilmot of Pennsylvania, fearful of the Southern slaveocracy, introduced a fateful amendment. It stipulated that slavery should never exist in any of the territory to be wrested from Mexico. The fiercely contested Wilmot Amendment twice passed the House, but not the Senate. Southern members, unwilling to be robbed of prospective slave states, fought the restriction tooth and nail. Anti-slavery men, in Congress and out, battled no less bitterly for the exclusion of slaves. The Wilmot Proviso never became federal law, but it was eventually endorsed by the legislatures of all but one of the free states, and it came to symbolize the burning issue of slavery in the territories. It was this issue of slavery's extension into the newly acquired lands in the West, more than any other, that drove the broadest and hottest wedge between North and South. Seen in historical perspective, the opening shots of the Mexican War were the opening shots of the Civil War. President Polk left the nation the splendid physical heritage of California and the Southwest, but also the ugly moral heritage of a toxic slavery dispute. Mexico will poison us, said the philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson. Even the great champion of the South, John C. Calhoun, had prophetically warned that Mexico is to us the forbidden fruit. The penalty of eating it would be subject our institutions to political death. 
Mexicans could later take some satisfaction in knowing that the territory wrenched from them by sword and musket proved to be a venomous apple of discord that could well be called Santa Ana's Revenge. <laughs>